we are lucky enough to hear this music or sound. Not bad. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So this was uh, back in the 90s, uh, trying to connect to the internet, this uh, beautiful dial-up mode and dialing us. And all of a sudden, it's this. Someone, so probably your mom or dad picked up the car and said, like, you said you would be studying. And I was just checking whether you were online or not, right? <laughs> That's how the web development was in the 90s. We still have the table, don't we? Yeah. Probably just play table. So uh, this was how web, uh, dev web was developed in the 90s, and people thought JavaScript was just a tiny tool for getting those uh, alert messages, or probably having your mark use or on-click events, right? Yeah. Let's fast forward from there to, uh, uh, say, 2005-ish, where everybody thought making native apps was the cool thing. So let's go app only. So you go to the website to buy something or order something, it says go to your app store or go to iOS to install and go to your app store or Google store or Play Store to install the app, right? So everybody was like, let's go app only. I'll let you guys to read the slide. So that's what happened with going app only. I'm going to take this use case of Flipkart uh, because I've been close with those guys who built uh, the app there, Bangalore India. Uh, so, how many of you think, uh, apart from engineers here, or uh, the end users would probably read what all, all the things the app is really accessing? Right? You would probably be used to the next test, install, accept all kind of thing. You will have paradigm, right? So, uh, you can see here the app is uh, looking for cameras, SMS, location, contacts, and stuff like that. There might be uh, use cases for that, uh, but my, my question is uh, how many of the users would read it? I also read somewhere that Uber is uh, accessing your uh, browsing history. Why would Uber need your browsing history? Probably they're doing some statistics on free Wi-Fi. I don't know. Uh, I really don't know the use case, but I just read that Uber is uh, using your, uh, trying to access your browsing history from that app, right? So uh, this app on native, uh, new people can give a random guess on what the size of this app would be, seeing all the things that it's doing on Android and iOS. Like yeah, yeah, it's it's around uh, 10, 10 to 11 on Android and around 40ish on iOS, right? Um, so the question is why? Uh, why do you, why do you really need so much of space? Uh, and and why do you want to access all this information without even uh, prompting the user? Probably once only the user gets to know us. While you while it's installing the app, and and later on the apps can go ahead and access whatever they want, right? So here's a, a simple GIF of the same thing built with HTML5, CSS, and some React JS. It's all JS and HTML. It does everything, almost everything that the native app does, except for uh, probably picking up the contacts and and reading the OTP and things like that, which it should be in the near future. So what what would be the size of this? Yes. Including the uh, the cash, all the cash assets and stuff. Five hundred. Five hundred. Kilobytes. Almost close. Okay. It's, it's around seven hundred KB. So uh, so so uh, to make it clear, it's not it's not a race between uh, web and native. You have to draw a, a middle line which works for all, right? So if 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 your use case is such that it needs a native app, or probably there something you need to use the contacts or some APIs that the web is not that supporting, probably yeah, native would be the way to go. But if, if, it's, if it's web that's solving your problem, I think it, it would be web which would help you all the way around, right? So so it's not a, it's not a race between web and native. Uh, it's about whichever solves your business, whichever makes the end users happy. And probably one might replace the other at the end of the day, or there might be something Third, which we have not heard, which, which would come in the race and kill both of them, right? So it's, it's, it's about that. I just wanted to make that clear before I proceed. Here is a simple use case. Uh, I'm not going to read all of them, but I'll probably give an example. Say, if if, uh, uh, if your friend doesn't have an app and you want to share it and ask ask your friend to install the app, what is the process you follow? Probably pass him an URL to the or say URL to the app or say, hey, go ahead and install this app. Then he would probably log into his app store and then download the application, install it, right? And then use it for some time and then find like it's 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 <coughs> enough space or memory probably uninstall it, right? So uh, at each level, uh, if you're targeting around 800 
or if your target number is around 800 audiences, right, right, for your application, for uh, for each level there's an increase of approximately 20 percent. So by the time the user uses it, it's 260 to in this case. So uh, so if it's web, it would just be a URL. The user would open it and use it instantly, and and the target would reach the tar almost 100 percent, right? It would if if your friend opens the URL, he has access to it. But in the contrast, if you see web is becoming more appy in nature and app is becoming more web like. What do we mean by that? If you see, if you saw, if you remember the GIF which we saw on Flipkart, it looks and feels like native app, right? It acts like a native app. And in the contrast, we have something called as instant loading apps. If you have heard of that, like where Google is experimenting on uh, loading a native app instantly on, on your device, right? So, so that that is more of a web web kind of feel, right? If you click on a URL and it loads instantly. So instant loading apps would always be web apps, right? So this was just a use case to show what's what would be the reduction and 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 with Flipkart, what what really happened was this. So uh, they their their load time decreased to uh, 70 seconds from 3.5 minutes, which is really big, and uh, 3x more of engagement and 40% uh, higher uh, re-engagement rate, 3x more time spent on the site. And uh, 3x less data, as we saw, like it's, it's around 700 MB versus uh, 10 to uh, 40 MB. So here we are here to talk about uh, uh, progressive web apps. So what are progressive web apps? Uh, this is a very nice illustration by Adi Osmani. Uh, I'm just picking up this image. Uh, so any, anything that's uh, installable uh, has a splash screen. Uh, works offline and it's connectivity independent. Doesn't it? Doesn't matter whether how many of you have heard on heard about life I guess. Oh, the internet through the uh, no, frequency. It's it's like LIE. I'm talking about LIE five. Uh, Jake from Google gave us term called life I where yeah. oh, life. No, uh, it's not through the light. It's like light. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm talking about the life. Uh, I me, is it used for like? Don't know networks. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Li-Fi is like fake Wi-Fi, and you're connected, but you're like your phone shows that you're connected and you're uh, on full Wi-Fi speed, but you're not really connected, right? So uh, it should be connect connectivity independent, as in it shouldn't matter whether you're on 4G, 5G, or low G at all. It should still work fine, right? And uh, it will, so if you see this, it's all like an app-like feel. So the name progressive, as in Progressive enhancement, of course, but the app eventually progresses itself to a beautiful, <coughs> native-looking and feel like an app. So, if you, what I mean to say that if you give it to a, a third, a third party or, a, or an end user, if you should not be able to differentiate between a native app versus a web app. So, so uh, we saw this era where uh, all these JavaScript programmers uh, who played a bit with Node became a full stack developer overnight. So I think people slowly will become a progressive web app developer or a full stack progressive web app developer, right? So the whole idea is to kill this dino, and we are killing that with something special, which we are going to see now. <coughs>
So you can think of uh, service worker as a client side <coughs> proxy. Uh, if, if so, so if your browser is here and your operating system is here, you can you think that the service worker is sitting here and it's smart enough to inspect all the network requests that happens. And it, it's not like application cache where you have to, you have to, uh, how many of you use application cache that day? Good. The lesser the number, the better, because uh, it was really a, a douchebag and it was brought down. And uh, because it has a lot of problems, as in you have to mention all of the files uh, that needs to be cached in your uh, application or manifest, and it was not truly offline, as in you didn't have control on the network. But with service worker, you get the real power to control each and every request. Uh, you could cache it, you could serve on the cache, you could do a network first on a cache first strategy, or you could see whichever wins would serve, and things like that, right? Uh, so it has a neat promise-based uh, API, and it's uh, highly influenced uh, by uh, shared workers and web workers. Uh, shared workers are like enhanced web workers, where web workers had the problem that each two web workers couldn't communicate with each other, right? That's where the shared, work, shared workers came into picture. And the design principle is of error recoverability. What I mean by that is, uh, say say you uh, you make a request for an URL and you're offline, right? Then you go and hit the cache. If the, if there's some data in the cache, you'll serve it. If it's it's not there in cache, you'll probably go and make a try to make a net network request. So if both of them fail, if, if the cache also fails and the network also fails, you should not end up showing uh, a 404 page or a line, right? That's that's the error recoverability part of it. And uh, service worker has no access to the DOM elements, uh, but it's, it has access to a few of the things here. Uh, it's set timeout, and uh, you could have uh, access to the navigator object, and uh, you have access to the location object, and it's read only. Uh, by the, what I mean by read only is you can see on what it is. You can't just say location.htf equals something and do the navigation. You can't do that. You can just see on what, what page we are on. And it, you can, of course, talk to the other uh, service uh, workers, right? I, I would uh, suggest you to go ahead and look into import <coughs> as well. It's one of the APIs that helps you to import the external uh, JS thing into in your service worker. Right? So uh, this, this talk is more of a precursor. I'm not probably going to dive into the uh, coding details of it. And we have like three minutes left, and let's see where we go from here. So uh, the service worker life cycle kind of looks like this. Uh, You'd you have an install, installing phase, and then you have an active phase, and it could also error out. After activation, uh, it can be in the idle state, as in if there's no network request happening, you can wait for it. And then when the, uh, from the idle state, it can get terminated, or if there's a new fetch happening, it, it gets a callback on the fetch also. So these are the different state for in which the service worker might bounce. This was the strategy I was talking about, the page, the network, and the cache what happens and where the service worker sits, right? It's a, this is a picture of uh, representation by Jake. Right? So the whole idea is to not to see your users waiting for what's happening, right? Should be instant and fast. And if you want to host your, if you're building for a service worker and you want to host it, if you don't have your domain with HTTPS, uh, if you have a domain, I, I hope you all have HTTPS to it. If not, please have HTTPS, maybe Cloudflare or something like that, or Let's Enter. Right. I need not talk about why S is important in the HTTPS. Or if you want to experiment, you can use GitHub.io and post it there, or use search.sh or now.sh and things like that. So, how do you, how does uh, it all boil down? To, like, if, if you if you look at the Flipkart app or any other uh, progressive app, probably I'll share the list with you. When you add it your you could add it your home screen. We saw that in the uh, the previous slides, right? You had an option to add to home screen. So once you add to home screen, uh, you see an icon. So how does that work? It works uh, by this thing called manifest JSON, where we mention how the icon should look like, what the app name should be, what is the full name of the app, what is the splash screen color, things like that. So if you're uh, lazy like me, you could use a module I wrote for manifest <coughs> JSON. You could just npm install globally and use manifest JSON. It will ask you a few questions and uh, generate the manifest JSON for you. And uh, I would also suggest you to have a look at what application shell is, how it works. It's about how progressively we lower it. And uh, this is this pattern called idle, and uh, this is pattern called rail, and this is pattern called purple, uh, where rail talks about what the response animation idle and load time should be, and how you should handle them. And uh, this is the purple pattern, uh, uh, where you can look for a push uh, render, uh, how you lazy load things and uh, 
how, how you pre-cache things. And so I would suggest you to have a look at purple. Uh, yeah, now running out of time, I try to push for a minute or two. Uh, so uh, I want to talk about this uh, push notification web always had uh, uh, notification support, but uh, not really push notification. Um, native web app developers would uh, always talk about, uh, we have this privilege to notify the user, uh, even though the app is down, or we can do push notification, and web can't do that. And uh, uh, we can add the home screen, we have icon standing there on the app drawer, and web doesn't have it. But all of this is getting solved, right? So here is a simple demo of push notification. You can just uh, have a look that we enabled a push notification there. And uh, in this example, you just do a curl call. So you get the push notification there. And uh, one thing to notice here, notice here is uh, whenever uh, there's an action happening, the users get alert for the first time, saying that, hey, I, this site needs to do a push notification. Are you OK with that? Uh, and if, if the user says allow, then, then it's like allow. Then it's and you can go to the setting and clear it out, or you can look at all the permissions that's been granted, like microphone or you know, camera access or things like that. And background sync is one such uh, event uh, that the service worker handles. Uh, in this example, we are uh, doing a uh, demo in the chat application here. Uh, what basically background sync is, is even though your app is killed, uh, when they say, say, say this, this is a scenario, uh, you're chatting with your friend and you go, you go offline because you're probably traveling or something. And you, you send, uh, I'm on my way or something. So, but once you get the network and, and you close the app, close the entire app, and once you get the network connectivity, uh, the message is being delivered to the other party, right? So that's, that's happening from the background scene when, even though the app is killed, uh, the service worker's uh, idling gets activated and the background scene event is being triggered, and then you could, uh, do whatever the request you want. So you have total control on what you are requesting and how you are requesting within the service worker. So if, if you want to uh, have scaffold a simple uh, a progressive web app, uh, I've been working on this with a couple of my friends uh, called Generator PWA. It's an uh, human generator. You can install this and just say your PWA and it will uh, generate scaffold out uh, uh, the basic uh, progressive web app for you. And if you want to check if the website is a progressive web app or not, you can just use this tool called ESPWA, which uses internally uses a, a project called Lighthouse from uh, open source from Google, uh, which kind of uh, grades the site and um, sees all the parameters and checks whether uh, gives a score. And based on this score, uh, this tool is predicting that whether the given URL is a progressive web app or not. <coughs> and uh, this slide I normally use for the questions. <laughs> and you can uh, uh, see me at stman.com or tweet me at Numans. And thank you. And hold on. I need to just, uh, as I promised, I need to uh, share you a few links. Uh, so PW Tips is one such uh, website that we are not at public, but I thought this is a good place to talk about it. And me and my friend are building this. And if you go to Code Labs, PW Tips slash Code Labs, this Code Labs is very much like the Google Code Labs, but it has all the steps, uh, whatever I talked about uh, from the introduction and steps. We have a basic thing to start with, and then we talk about what actual is and what the purple pattern is and things like that, and talk about service worker, the code, how, how do we instantiate the service worker, what are all the life cycles. And, and if you want to see all the list of uh, PWS, you can just Google for awesome PWA, and you will land here uh, into this repo where you have all the apps, different apps. Uh, I, need, I think I need to show this app and tutorials, articles, and videos, and slides, and, and whatnot. If you find something interesting <coughs> or if you find something is missing, please uh, send it to, <coughs> to the same website. That is one of our progressive web app which you can use to annoy your uh, co-workers. Uh, that's built by <laughs> one. Me. And have fun. Thank you, guys. If you guys are building a progressive web app and if you are facing any problems, you can just tweet to me, you should tweet at me and there are a few folks of mine and with me like uh, who are Google developer experts on, uh, on that. And I will see that we will help you on resolving your issues. Do you have time for questions? Yeah, we'll give questions, sir. Um, I, I was looking at Flipkart today and it seems like the light version is only on mobile. Yeah. So, 
What's with that? So uh, is, is this not for desktop or is uh, it only for mobile? Yeah, the desktop they are rebuilding the entire stack. Uh, my friends uh, <coughs> are there in Bangalore. They said they have a new strategy for desktop. And it's not like this, only for mobile. And that's a very good question. The thing is, it works on Android Chrome and Android uh, Firefox or Android Opera. Flipkart also works for Android uh, Chrome iOS, but normal progressive web apps wouldn't work for Chrome iOS. Any, any idea why, why is that? It doesn't run Chrome on iOS. <laughs> exactly. So it's, 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 the face is Chrome and the base is more of Safari. Right? So if you guys want to see, if you iOS users, how many? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are really missing the privilege of using progressive web apps. And if you love it and if you want to use it, tweet at Apple, tweet at Safari guys, ask them for service orders. Right? Um, all right. So uh, my, my question is, so will, de will desktop have service workers? Will it be the same as, or will, they, or will there be two different sides? Uh, yeah, uh, so it, it, would be the, it, it should be the same. So service worker is not just about offline. And I want to say it again, it's not just about offline, but it's about performance also. So if you have a desktop application and if you use your service worker, uh, for the second time when the user hits the site, uh, you could serve things from cache and it would be really fast. Well, doesn't the browser do that by default? Uh, it does, but not for all the network requests, right? So if, if say, say I make a network request uh, for uh, a, a video, right? And if I've, if I've, ca if my, if I've cast it already in my service worker, I make a call to that video again, I, I could save that. But that should be in your, in your cache already, no? Mm -hmm. No, it, it won't be because uh, it, it goes through my service worker and my service worker knows that I have been cached, I have cached this video. So for every response, you could, you could inspect the response you are for every request, you could inspect the request you are and see whether it's there in your cache and serve it from there. So that that's where you could in, improve the performance. It's not just about offline experience. From a user experience perspective, they need to still go to a brow open a browser and then type in the URL. No, that's only one thread. After which you can add to your home screen and you could use it. So so if I, if I want to show a quick example here, uh, this is one uh, app called JS Features. <coughs> it's just like all the JavaScript features. So it just uh, it's on my home screen and I can use it. Right? Okay. So it just behaves like a native app. So uh, how do we like you know make the people like you? You just say go and download this app. Right? Is it possible to deliver that link to the home page? Yeah, it, 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 see, it's like I just go to JS uh, Features dot in, and then it says uh, add to home screen. So I add to home screen and it gets added. But we are, but people are still working on uh, things like having a Play Store kind of thing for progressing web apps. There is uh, uh, PWA uh, rocks you can site which it. collects all the such <coughs> PWAs. And uh, there's also uh, suggestions on having add to home screen button directly on Google search. If, if, if the thing you're searching is a progressive web app in itself, you could just add to home screen directly. Right? Okay, thank you. Ha <laughs> <laughs>